thank you, Randy, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to talk within 10 minutes, but maybe or so. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll have my slides are flexible, so if I talk too much, I'll, I'll cut some of them from the end. Uh, so as Randy mentioned, um, I'm going to use that one to point. Uh, I'm the director of uh, this center as U at USC called Integrated Media Systems Center. Uh, the center was uh, founded in 1996. Uh, I was involved with the center from day one. I was its first employee. Uh, the founding director of the center uh, is uh, Max Nikias. Uh, some of you might have heard of him. He's the president of USC. And uh, uh, basically one of the, so the center was originally funded by NSF, uh, National Science Foundation, uh, for 11 years. Um, and the uh, NSF basically make a major investment in these centers and because of that they want this center to continue. They don't want them after the NSF funding finishes. So uh, currently the center is uh, operating in the self-sustained mode. Um, I had a video of uh, showing you basically what the center is about, but the audio here doesn't work very well, so I'm just going to uh, tell you what uh, the main vision of the center is using some animation. Um, so our uh, vision in one word, we call it geo-immersion, and what it means is we would like to blend uh, the real world and the virtual world. Uh, so to tell you what that means, um, just move the mouse away. Um, so if you look at uh, all the sensors collecting data from real world, uh, there are a lot of data actually collected, starting all the way from space, where you have satellite imagery and um, multispectral imagery. Then it gets closer. You have aerial sensors uh, like UAVs. You might know it as drones. Uh, the kinds that collect data. And uh, even closer, you have uh, fixed sensors on road networks, for example, cameras or loop detectors that uh, collect traffic information. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And then even closer, where you have people carrying smartphones, and each smartphone these days have five to 10 sensors collecting all sorts of information at a much higher resolution, both temporally and spatially. And even closer, you have human body sensing. Uh, where uh, we have sensors at IMSC collecting uh, blood pressure, oxygen intake, and some little invasive one that can also measure the sugar in your blood. Uh, so these are all the data collected from the real world. And at the same time, you're all familiar with all the data collected from virtual world. All your shopping behavior is collected by Amazon, all your social behavior by Facebook, uh, all your location by Foursquare, uh, all your uh, emails by Gmail. Um, so imagine now that you blend these two words. Uh, of course, this is a major privacy invasion, but let's not worry about that. Uh, but, but for us, uh, as computer science folks, this is a very interesting challenge because these are large data sets frequently coming at you and uh, at, from different uh, uh, sources and different modalities, so heterogeneous, and therefore, integrating them to make sense of them is very challenging. And the main vision of IMSC is to integrate things around time and space. So we, by, by tagging every piece of data with time and space, we think that it's a much easier task now to connect them and connect the dots and make sense of them. And that's our approach, basically, to uh, uh, these challenges of integrating data and making sense of it that Randy mentioned. And we would like to go beyond uh, just the graphic and visualization aspect of it. This is when IMSC started. We were looking at that. Uh, also beyond just the fact of integrating data, but talking about fusion of human behavior. Can we use the human behavior in one world to impact this behavior in the other world and vice versa? And that's, I think, is the most interesting uh, application of this geo-immersion. So as you see, the main problem uh, for, for just the vision is dealing with large amount of data. And the reason we call them big data is not that just the data size is large, so volume is just one aspect of it, but because, it, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, speed of data that continuously coming as, at you, the real-time aspect of it, and the heterogeneity aspect of it are other challenges of big data. So uh, if, if you are with uh, computer science field, you probably think, OK, big data is a buzzword. and uh, computer science folks have been dealing with big data for a long time. So what's new? Uh, the one thing that is new 
is that for the first time I can walk to a party and somebody asks me what you work on, I say big data and they leave me alone. Right? <laughs> In the past, I, I needed to say, oh, we have all these data set, and we do queries on them, and, and by that time, they were basically bored, right? So this time, at least I can just in one word say what we do. Uh, but the, the real, I guess, uh, aspect of big data is that there are two camps in computer science, right? There's one camp that they do data mining, machine learning, statistics, whatever you want to call it. And they are very good in coming up with sophisticated analysis of, of data, right? But if you look at all the research and things that they do, at the end of the day, they work with files. They work with Excel files or MATLAB files. So the, at the end of the day, the data is actually cut and sliced by people and get prepared for that analysis, right? On the other end, you have the other camp that they are very good in dealing with large amount of data, building big systems. Uh, some of them are from databases, some of them from uh, distributed systems, high performance computing. And they are very good in building these things, but the sort of analytics that they do on top of this data is very simple. So they, for example, database folks support queries, uh, and that's all they do, right? Uh, and I can't say that because I'm a database person, so I can make fun of myself. But um, there are, like for, for uh, cloud, like Google, MapReduce is very good in doing, for example, keyboard searches and page rank, right? But any other sophisticated graph analytics, you cannot do it in any of these uh, systems. It's an open problem, right? So that, I think, is the, the, the reason for this new uh, hype of big data, is that we want the combination of the two. We want not only the techniques that combine the two, but we want people that understand both of them. And we want to train these sort of uh, students on, in, in universities. and. In addition to this, and I didn't have time to put that, but there's a slide I have also that we need some people that understand at least one application. Uh, because that's where the real world data set comes from and that's where the real requirements are. If, if, if you're successful in training these sort of people, I think that's what the uh, world outside is looking for. So with that uh, introduction, I would uh, very quickly want to tell you that there are three uh, application areas we are focusing on at IMSC. Uh, as, as examples of uh, our vision of geo-immersion, one is in the area of transportation, surveillance, and uh, if you may, smart cities, uh, using IBM term. Um, and uh, under each one of them, there are different challenges of big data that we're looking at. Like, for example, in transportation, our focus is on data acquisition, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that one. Uh, surveillance, we do big data analytics, uh, text analytics, and video analytics. And then on Intelligent Campus, we do uh, big data collection, something we call geo-crowdsourcing. But if I have time, I will tell you a little bit about that as well. Uh, but my main focus is going to be on the first one. Uh, March 8, next Thursday, uh, our center has its annual retreat. And we're going to go deep into all of these, all the way to the posters. So if you're interested to come, drop me an email. And I'll be happy to host you there uh, on March 8 to, if you want to learn more. Now, why we are looking at transportation, um, uh, if you're from LA, you know that traffic is a major problem. Actually, Saturday Night Live has a uh, skit about uh, all the people in LA always referring all the time to their freebies when, when they talk about anything. Uh, so I wanted to actually show that too, but uh, I, I can't. But just search LA traffic and Saturday Night Live and you, you'll find it. Um, so the, the problem with uh, traffic is that it wastes time and it wastes money. It wastes energy, right? So, and these are the two most important commodities of our century, energy and time. Uh, there are a lot of numbers out there. Uh, one example is uh, last year Time Magazine had some article with some of these numbers. And this is, for example, it says that in LA, uh, per person you waste 64 hours per year, right? Uh, the good news here is that Washington DC is worse than LA. Uh, for us. Uh, so I don't know, San Francisco is okay, I don't know about San Jose, uh, but I'm sure that you do waste time and money as well. Uh, and then if you uh, remember the 2010 article by McKenzie uh, that started the whole big data hype, uh, the largest uh, consumer saving was coming from uh, uh, addressing the transportation and traffic challenge. Uh, the 300 billion, was, which was the second number, was health. So transportation was double the health that you can potentially uh, uh, 
provide consumers with saving. And if you read more in the article, it's become very specific. It says that you use location-based services to use real-time traffic and weather data right, to avoid congestion. And this is exactly what we're doing at uh, IMSC. We developed this technology to exactly do that. Uh, we haven't received the $600 billion yet, uh, but, but the technology is there. Um, and uh, this is uh, facilitated mainly by LA Metro, kind of Department of Transportation in LA, um, where uh, gave us an ex exclusive contract about three years ago, uh, which provided us all the, col all the data collected in LA transportation, all the road network data. So I tell you what these are. So they, it starts basically with uh, loop detectors or traffic sensors at uh, highways. So there are 4,000 of those sensors generating data every 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds, we get real-time data about the traffic at different segments of highways. We also get another 4,000 sensors on arterials, on surface streets. And they also, these generate every one minute, they generate data. We get the location of 2,000 buses and rail uh, trains uh, in LA County. And that also comes to us every, every one minute. Uh, we get the ramp meters. These are the entrance and exits of freeway. So we count the cars coming in and going out. Uh, and also events. Uh, so an example of event is that there's an abandoned chair in third lane of I-405, which is a much more uh, typical incident than you want to. And then there is a change messaging system, which is a subset of those events that are important, like accidents, um, and sometimes child abductions and things like that that show up on the message board. And we get on average 800 of these per day, okay? So all this data coming to us in real time generates about 46 megabyte every minute. And this is the part of the big data that the size is not really the matter. The matter is that it keeps coming at you, the streaming, the continuous aspect of it. Uh, so we built uh, different types of querying and analysis to clean the data. Then the result would be about 26 megabyte per minute. And this goes to cloud, and we do indexing and things like that on top of the cloud. And at the end, this is provided now for analysis. So that's what I meant by in incorporating the whole system aspect and the analysis together. And an example of an analytics we do is that uh, because of the data we get on the events, we know, for example, in the past there were accidents, uh, two-car accident um, uh, involving uh, uh, body injury, for example, at uh, this time of the day, at this lane of the freeway, we have exact information. And we also have exact information about how the sensors behave on the upstream of the accident, right? That comes from the sensor data. So putting these two together, we can build models, uh, predictive models, that would tell us, for example, how the sensors would behave in these type of accidents in future. Right? So in case in future we get a message that there's an accident in front of you, using this data we can say, hey, this accident will clear in 10 minutes. So if it takes 20 minutes for you to get there, just keep going. Don't worry about it. The accident will disappear by the time you get there. Right? So these are the big data analytics that can help. Um, and this project been supported by, by many uh, uh, industry. And they're going to be there on Thursday as well. So it's a good in, uh, networking event if you want to come as well. Um, so we wanted now to take this to consumers. right? So we went not we, as, a, as an academics, we don't publish just papers. We usually do just publish papers, but uh, every once in a while we actually do a tech transfer. And here we started a company a couple of weeks ago on paper uh, where we build an app. So there's an app for it. Uh, and the app it basically is a navigation similar to Google uh, or whatever. And it utilizes all the data that I told you to give you a better path. Now let me tell you what better path means. Uh, so here is an example of... Uh, going from West LA to USC campus. If you're USC alum, you probably, this is the path you usually took. Um, uh, and this is 8 AM now. And you go to Google, and this is the path that Google suggests. Again, if you're from LA, do you know what's wrong with this path? <laughs> yeah, so this is going to take like hours. Uh, and the reason is the, this intersection of 405 and 10, right? This is a great lock at, at 8.30. Uh, so you don't like this path. You say, give me their second option in Google. And Google gives you this option, uh, which is not, not solving the problem, because still, because of this grid lock, you still have a backlog here, right? So that's not helping you as well. So you ask Google, OK, give me your third option. <laughs> so what's wrong with this option? If, 
so this, this is just too long, right? Uh, and do you know why uh, Google give you this option? Exactly. So Google technique for, and that's what I meant when I said uh, any sophisticated graph analytics, you cannot do it on MapReduce. So the, this graph is just too big, too complex with a lot of roads and stuff. So the way that Google deal with it is that it uh, simplify the problem by just looking at freeways. So it basically do it in a hierarchical way. It starts from your location, use the surface street to get you to the closest freeway, then it keeps you on freeway until you get close to your exit, and then again look at the surface street. So by doing this hierarchical way of uh, looking at the graph, it tries to do this fast, right? Uh, now the problem is that Google knows very well that, for example, in this pad, all this area is red, right? Google is actually the one that has the best traffic, real-time traffic data, but it cannot utilize it because it doesn't know what else to do because at that point it only sees freeways. It doesn't, sees, it doesn't see the, the, the surface street. Uh, I have another slide actually look at the uh, other approaches like your car navigation that uses real time, but I don't have time. But this is the path that we would give you for that time, right? And it exactly uses the surface street to get you to the freeway after you pass the grid log. And if you leave a, a little later at 8.30, it actually takes you out of the freeway even earlier before you get to USC and takes the surface street to USC. Right? And we did a lot of comparison that we showed that on the average we save 18% in time. Uh, and this is not only the rush hour throughout the, year, the day. If you only look at rush hours, it's actually better. Um, so I think uh, I don't have time to tell you about our geo crowdsourcing. Uh, so I'm just going to show you some, some slides. This one actually, uh, PBS uh, in January used our uh, tool. There's an acknowledgement, if you can read down there, acknowledging IMSC and USC uh, for the coverage of inauguration uh, using our geo crowdsourcing tool uh, that hopefully we're going to also tech transfer that in five, six months as a new company. Uh, it basically generates uh, panoramic uh, on the fly using uh, different, cam different phones and different people's uh, videos and audios. Uh, no, videos and pictures, no idea. Um, so anyway, just to wrap up, uh, I talked about three different, uh, I didn't talk about, but I mentioned three different applications and the challenges of big data under each one of them. And if you're interested, we're actually putting all these together, as I mentioned, as one product. This is our future venture. It's called MediaQ. And if you're interested to see the concept, you can go to that YouTube. Uh, and this is not a typo. It's actually a YouTube site uh, that, that you can go and look at the five-minute video of the MediaQ. So do we have questions now or later? Uh, we'll take just a couple questions for the speaker, and then we'll transition the presentation over to Jonathan Taplin as our second speaker. Is there any question for Cyrus? There's a question over here, and I'm supposed to pass a microphone. So, hello. Okay. Hey. Uh, first of all, I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, so I kind of have two questions that are follow up. Um, so one thing is that the it seems like the path that your app presented to the user was very attractive because perhaps not as many people knew about it. And so it provided a low traffic route to the same destination. But for example, let's say your app gets really popular because it works very well. But all of a sudden now it's presenting the same you know, route to a many different users. So it, it creates a problem within itself where it's suggesting the same path to users um, in a way that maybe Google Maps has actually increased the traffic problem. Right? So what are your thoughts on that? And also as a follow-up question, um, do you think maybe even further into the future there's an opportunity to perhaps intelligently route people? if enough users sort of hit this critical mass, sort of like a packet through a graph or something like right. that. So this is a perfect uh, question, and the reason is that I know the answer. Uh, I, 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 have, I have four answers, actually, to that, because it's a very typical question I usually get. The first one is the humorous one. If our app gets so popular that actually impact people's behavior and so on, I will be in Hawaii drinking Mai Tais. <laughs> No, the, the, the real answer, you actually kind of mentioned one of the answers, which is that current situation is Google with one, two, or three paths, right? This at least gives you more, right? So this is already better than, than the current situation. The, the, the answer I give to investors is that uh, if we have enough money to update our patterns fast enough, right, which technologically we can, but we just need more servers, more, more infrastructure, then as the traffic 
changes, our patterns get updated. So automatically, we'll send you different ways. So these, these paths are not created manually. These are created automatically based on the patterns that we created from historical data. Now, if you keep updating these patterns in real time, then you can react to things like that. That if people move here, then suddenly that area become crowded. So it's going to give you an alternative path differently. Now, the, the fourth answer is actually the answer to your second question. Uh, which is that currently, this is academic answer now, uh, currently the techniques, the algorithms we use are all selfish algorithms. We'll basically take you from point A to point B and it selfishly works for you as one person, right? So uh, if you're familiar, these are A-star, D-star type algorithms. However, if you want to uh, optimize globally, then you need to use network flow type algorithms. It's exactly the type of algorithms you, you mentioned that are also used for uh, communication network where then you might actually, some people may suffer. So you might send them somewhere that is actually worse for them, right? But the graph as a whole, the network would flow better, right? So we, and we are not doing that. We want to buy the premium. <laughs> um, <laughs> we take one other question, and then we'll move over. Oh, Cyrus, I enjoyed your, uh, your you. presentation. Uh, I, maybe I'm too old. I want to take you back to AI world. Uh, AI was promising a lot, a, a lot, uh, and uh, it was short on delivering. As a matter of fact, not short in the sense of uh, you could you could you could focus on areas. Uh, scaling the AI to give you the right answer was really challenging, and I have a number of examples on that. I'm not going to go into detail of that. So, what really is going to shine on the big data is the analytics, and if you focus on one specific small area, like navigation, right? Uh, one could say, okay, the next area is going to take the same amount of energy that AI took and didn't get anywhere, and the next area after that, and on and on and on. And this is going to be just a, you know, a drain pipe, and it's not going to get uh, get us anywhere. What are your thoughts on that? Thank well, that that's actually a good point. And I, uh, so the reason I, I, I focus on navigation and I went all the way to an app <coughs> was exactly to show that there's a real world uh, uh, application for this, and it can be done for real world, right? However, uh, the techniques that we use on underneath, right? The data analytics technique that we use to utilize real time data to generate patterns. Uh, to use build models to do these access. They're all built on real-time data coming at you in this real system. It's not a toy system, right? So now take that and apply it to a different uh, uh, domain like health and replace the sensors that collect traffic data with sensors that collect uh, uh, human, tracked human data, for example, elderly in the home, for example. It's the same thing. I mean, you, you, you collect the data, you generate patterns, you model it, you predict what's going to happen, and then react to it. So I think the underlying research is definitely relevant, and it's, it's a big data research, so <coughs> it, it's not toy problems. Uh, but uh, it's going to still require some customization, some tweaking per application. And that's also, I think, it's important. Okay. This is not a I hope it does not fall <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Cyrus, very Thank much. <laughs> okay. uh, Jonathan Taplin is our next speaker. Jonathan has a quite a fascinating background. Uh, you can look him up on the internet to get the details, but it spans cinema, music, and technology. And I think he'll be focusing on the technology side tonight. Jonathan. Thanks, Randy. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little about one of the research tracks at the Annenberg Innovation Lab. Innovation Lab is a lab that's funded by these companies, and all of them have a common interest in the place that the social network and analytics play in the world that we live in today. Um, so we started this research track uh, two years ago, about now, um, when there was an extraordinary revolution happening in the streets of Cairo. And we began to look at the gigantic amount of Twitter traffic that was coming out of Cairo to try and understand what was going on. And the first thing we did was we took the hashtag January 25th, which was the hashtag that the students were using, because that's the day that Mubarak left, as, as the symbol for the revolution. 
and we started doing semantic analysis on it. So this is a tool with the help of IBM that would, that would take two words, word one and word two, or word one in this case is word two. And it then would bring out of all these 800,000 tweets that we were looking at that had happened over three days, what was the biggest thing? And when the machine started to work, these words popped out, video is history. And we thought that was pretty significant in the sense that here for the first time, a, a group of young people who had lived in a world in which only the state had control of video, that the state controlled the television, the state controlled everything, these kids were taking their cell phones and they were putting it up on YouTube, putting it up on Facebook, and they were making history. And that was a huge change. So we began to apply these tools to other domains. Uh, we wanted to think about, because obviously some of the partners in the lab are uh, motion picture companies, we wanted to think about what would happen, and I'm, and I'm sorry, these slides were originally on a, a 16 by 9 floor bath. That's why it looks so weird here. So uh, somehow it got converted by someone at Randy's office. Um, anyway, uh, we want to look at not only what happens before a movie opens in terms of what the Twitter traffic is saying and what it would indicate about how well the movie is going to open, but we also wanted to see could movie marketers change the nature of the social media conversation. So this is from uh, October of 2011, and the movie that was going to open on the next weekend was a movie called Puss in Boots. It was an animated film from DreamWorks, and as you can see, the movie that was opening two weeks after that was a movie called Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn. And at this point, Twilight Saga is completely dominating the conversation, obviously because there are a lot of teenagers who are completely into Twilight Saga, right? So then DreamWorks took out $30 million of TV advertising, and then we measured it right after that buy. And as you can see, it actually worked. That Puss in Boots now became the center of the social media conversation. It's graphic, the green indicates positive, red indicates negative. Uh, and, and so we now are into the place where we try and measure different kinds of advertising. So if you, Warner Brothers, drop 20 million on TV advertising on a Wednesday, and let's say on the next Monday you drop 4 million on web banner ads, does one give you a significantly greater return on investment than the other? And we think we're beginning to understand how that works, and, and this to us seems important. So this is from just the recent Twilight, and this is another example of what happened. So here's Twilight. It's going to open on November 16th, uh, the Wednesday before. It's pretty dominant, even though Skyfall, which should open the weekend before, it's doing very well. Um, and the day it opens, of course, it just sucks up all the oxygen in the social media sphere. It takes up all the things, and by the way, the 31% that were negative on Twilight were mostly people saying, I'm so sad it's all over. That, you know, <laughs> so you know, we had to go look at that. Now, here's the, the interesting question. This is a film called Rise of the Guardians, which was going to open on November 23rd. So this is a week out before it's opening. They obviously had thought that, well, we're not going to be in the same day as Twilight, okay. But as you can see, nobody's even talking about Rise of the Guardians. And of course, by the time it does open, it, it opened terribly because Twilight had essentially sucked all the oxygen out of the marketplace. So um, again, we think these are instructive things. And now, you know, and we've done other things. We've looked at the, the relationship between TV ratings and tweets. They're very close. In other words, the number of positive tweets and the TV ratings on the ALCS was very similar. 
Um, we looked at things like the Super Bowl. So last, not this year, but last year, um, Tom Brady was, all the sports writers saying he was going to be the star of the Super Bowl. And our Twitter followers said, no, Eli Manning is going to be the star. And they turned out to be right. And the sports writers were all wrong. We looked at movies over time, over the Oscars, and this is a chart that's still up on the web and on our site where you can literally move the dial and see these various things go up and down. And so this notion of being able to look on a very granular level uh, to us seems very important. We were flattered that this year Twitter themselves did their own version of what we did last year. Um, and so now what we're going into is uh, using a real-time analytics engine that we built with the help of another lab at USC called SAIL, which stands for Signals Analysis and Interpretation Lab. This is a lab that does basically natural language processing. Uh, we run it on a platform that IBM gave us called InfoStreams. And essentially what we can do is look at real-time data coming from any given broadcast. So this is, was the Oscar broadcast. And you can see the spikes at various points, exactly when the important things happen. And what we're beginning to think of is, if you think about the analytic tools that TV producers have at at their behest at this point, it is the same tool called the Nielsen Ratings that existed in 1954. What the Nielsen Ratings is, is 2,500 homes that have a little box on the top of their TV set. And each member of the family has a button on that box. And if you're in the room, you go and push the button on your box, your dad's button, mom's button, junior's button. And all Nielsen does is tell you every 15 minutes what channel that TV is turned to. Now, as far as you know, mom could be, have pushed her button and gone into the kitchen and made a sandwich and wasn't even watching the TV, which is why Nielsen says that the average hours, that the average family watches 300 minutes, could that possibly be true? 300 minutes a day, yeah, they do. It's like it's insane. So my sense is a lot of these Nielsen sets are just left on all the time. Anyway, what we want to do is look at the real-time sentiment. So this is the real-time sentiment of the Oscars. This is positive, this is negative. And we think that this ability to look at it at a 30-second increment allows you to really know what's going on. So if, for instance, the seg sentiment turned really bad at minute you know, 20, 30 here, what was going on? And then you could go in and you could look at the tweets and you could really understand what's happening. So we think it's useful. We're going to try it out with our new partner, Fox, on some of the reality shows, and we're going to see if it's a more useful tool for producers to understand what happens. One final thing we did was we got into the domain of politics. And so during the course of the presidential race, from the beginning of the Republican primaries to the very end, we recorded every single tweet on politics for the whole year. So we have a gigantic data set, but we did it in real time, which is pretty interesting. So this is just to give you an example what the dashboard looked like. This is the, the moment, this is the moment when Obama gives his victory speech. As you can see at this point, Mitt Romney has kind of trailed off. Um, but I want to warn everybody that Twitter, at least our experience from politics, is not a tool for positive sentiment. It is a tool for negative sentiment. 70% of the tweets that we collected were sarcastic, snarky, or outright negative, and at some point, because we had a dashboard that would say what were the most positive or what were the most negative tweets of the moment, you would see some stuff that you wouldn't want your mother to see. I mean, it was really kind of sad. And it led us to not believe that the 
notion of Twitter as a great civic tool is, to me, kind of bullshit. But anyway, <laughs> um, so here's the problem. Computers are not very good at sarcasm. When we started this work, one of the first tweets we looked at was, I am so happy Michelle Bachman threw her tinfoil hat in the ring. The computer thought that that was really positive for, for Michelle Bachman. So what we did was we built an annotation panel on the hand, you know, on the mobile app for this. So that anybody could come and say, no, that tweet was not positive, it was negative, and by the way, it was sarcastic or it was funny. And slowly over the course of the campaign, we began to learn and teach the computer about sarcasm. We think this is really important because we think sarcasm relates to everything in the social media universe. And we're hoping to be able to do, get some you know, IP around this. Uh, we think it's pretty important work. Um, just to give you one other sense of the, the toughness of this work. So this is volume of tweets during the course of the campaign. So when we did these first three presidential debates, we were analyzing in real time 400 tweets a second. And the machine didn't break. So that's a tribute to IBM's technology, but it's also some heavy lifting. And so um, we think this is the beginning of some interesting stuff. And uh, we hope anybody who's interested, let me know. I'm Jay Taplin at usc.edu. OK? Thank you. We'll take two questions, one here and one there. You want to give him the microphone? Sorry. So for in the example of um, movie, uh, theater ticket sales, you had an independent verification, you had the tweets and you had the tickets. Right. What other independent verifications do you have of like the politics and things like that, that the Twitter analysis actually represented of the larger population? Uh, as I said, the best verification we had was this human annotation. In other words, we had almost 30,000 people over the course of 16 months actually went in and did some annotation. Oh, right. Oh, okay. So we did not think that this is a, a, a change that would ch throw the, you know, Gallup out of business. We simply think this is an interesting way of trying to monitor the social conversation. We do not think it translates to who's going to vote for whom. And in fact, as you could see in that one slide of the moment that Obama won, his negatives were 10 times as high as his positives. So it, it has nothing to do with polling. In fact, quite honestly, the more we work we did, the more we realized that one of the things that it does happen to do is that People get their reputation on Twitter by being snarky and funny. And in fact, during the debates, the most retweeted stuff were from comedians, like Jon Stewart or Chris Rock. And then the second most retweeted stuff were people who were pretending to be comedians, whose identity literally disappeared four days after the debate. So they were probably trolls placed by the campaign to do stuff, you know, so. so yeah, so I was just curious on the, you said 30,000 people were doing the annotations? Yeah. How did you recruit those poor suckers to do that? First, first we recruited them from Amazon Turk, from Mechanical Turk. So that was the first part. And then pretty soon it got to be out what we were doing. We were doing a lot of publicizing. Uh, 
Well, we obviously had our RAs look at, at segments of what was coming back and say this seems to be right or not, you know. Um, but what happened once the debate started were real humans. You know, people not bought, paid for by Amazon Turk, but just people who happened to be political junkies, people that were following this. We did a fair amount of publicity about it. So, Jonathan, the Nielsen example you gave, yeah. private data, and they monetize it by selling it to advertisers or right. whoever. In this case, the Twitter feeds are public domain. Right. How do you reconcile who owns that data and the insight derived from it and how it might be monetized? Well, first off, everybody who's on Twitter is trying to be public. It, in fact, the whole purpose of it is to you know, publicize yourself. So we assume it's public data. Uh, we haven't tried to monetize it, but I promise you there are 30, 40 little startups, uh, Radian 6, I mean, there's a bunch of startups that do black box monetizing of this. The problem we have about all these startups is they will never show your map. The, they will never show people what's in the black box. They just say, take our word for it. So we go to a lot of conferences and we actually show, hey, you know, this is about 63%, you know, a little bit better than a flip of a coin. But, you know, a lot of firms out there who are selling a product say, oh, it's perfect. And we don't think they're being honest because we think this sarcasm thing is hugely indicative of what's going on. So we should have a little more time for questions after our last presentation, uh, which will be Dimitri Williams. Thank you, Jonathan. And Dimitri. I'm working. OK, good. So I'm going to start off by telling you guys a couple of odd stories that will hopefully come together. And the first deals with medicine and obesity. And it's a story I'm stealing from somebody else. And the second story involves uh, the CIA and elves. And this will somehow come together to talk about big data, analytics, uh, the social network sphere, startup technology, all kinds of fun stuff. I, I promise there will be a payoff to this. So let's start with uh, medicine. And this is a story I riff off of from somebody else. It's sort of a necessary step to tell you about. What I'm going to talk about mostly in the next 10 minutes is the combination of big data processes and the power of social network analysis. So everyone's talking about social media and social networks, and we're all on Facebook, and all these things are happening. At the same time, there has been this explosion in mathematical techniques that actually look at networks, derive their properties, and tell you things about them. That's one of the things my group does, and does so at a large scale in, a, in, some, in some pretty new ways. But this is how we got some of our inspiration. There's a book called Connected by some researchers named Christakis and Fowler. If you guys haven't read it and you're interested in the kind of things I talk about, it's a pretty good accessible way of learning about these things without having to listen to professors like me drone on about them. What they did was they got a bunch of data from a, a community in upstate New York, and the, those people are represented here by these dots on the graph. And what they did for the first time is they had health data, but they also knew who was connected to who else. So they could see if you are smoking or not smoking, if you are dying of cancer, what's happening, and who else in your network did the same thing. So the first time ever that they could combine a network graph, which is what these things are called, with actual outcomes. And that was different and new and cool. And one of the things they found was if they looked at that network graph over time, you could see that things happened and those things weren't random. So this is another way of saying we actually influence and affect each other. And you can actually see this in the math. So this particular graph is the same community of people in this upstate uh, New York town, little town, you know, just a few hundred people in it, and people families, relationships, 10 years apart. And you can see from time one to time two that it's still the same people, but the graph got a little more complicated, which means that more people were connected to each other than before, which kind of matches what we know about human nature. Now here's the fun part. I tell you that the size and the color of those nodes, the people, indicates whether they are slim or obese. This is a graph of how fat people got, right? And if you look at it, you think over 10 years of time, more people got fat. And this rings true with what we know about what's been happening in the US. We have more fat people. OK. Now, I look at this graph, and what I think is what's really cool is that fatness is not random in this graph. If it was affecting everybody equally, if we didn't influence each other at all, 
fatness would be all over the place. And instead, it shows up in these gross, mucousy colored clusters all over the graph, right? So you've got, you know, if you're this big fat person and you're this fat person, something was happening there socially. In other words, fatness appears to be contagious, which is bizarre. Like, you're going to talk to somebody and you're going to get fat from talking to them? No, not at all. But think about the following example. You go to work in a new company and you're a slim, svelte, hardworking, exercise fiend, and your new coworker says, hey, great to meet you, and you want to make friends with them. Oh, you guys want to go out to lunch? Yeah, okay, where are you going? I'm going out for this new fried chicken place. It's awesome. Okay, I'm coming with you. Your likelihood of being fat just went up because you are connected to a person who's getting fat also. And this is what these researchers found, is that over and over, lots of human phenomena work in this contagious, influential way. Starting smoking spread through a network like contagion. Quitting smoking spreads through a network like contagion. Being in a good mood spreads through a network like contagion. Like let's say you have a great day at work. When you go home, your family is more likely to be in a good mood. Likewise, if you go to work and people crap all over you, you're going to go home and your, your relatives and friends and spouses are more likely to be in a bad mood later on. We're social. These things propagate. Okay, now on to the CIA and elves. We were commissioned um, by a, a group called IARPA. You all have heard of DARPA because they get all kinds of sexy headlines. IARPA is the social science wing, so they don't make cars that drive themselves. They ask weird questions about human nature. And one of the things they asked was, can you look at data from video games and tell us who the terrorists are? I'm not making this stuff up. Is your tax dollars at work? And I was like, yes, that's my kind of project. <laughs> so I run a group of people that look at video game data and we want to understand human nature. And here was a big data challenge, because I started getting data from video games about 10 years ago, and the very first time I asked a company for a data batch, I got it, and it came on an external hard drive, and I looked at this external hard drive, and I thought, what the hell do I do with this thing? And the problem was, it was so big, I couldn't load it into any program I had. Here I'm a social scientist, I'm using SPSS, it's all good, I'm going to throw stuff into Excel, I'm going to run regressions, whatever, and then a four terabyte drive shows up, and I'm like, I I'm out, you know, I, I got nothing. So that meant I had to go make friends with computer scientists. I had to understand what Cyrus is talking about, right? And 10 years ago, I had no idea what Cyrus was talking about. Now I have great respect and a little, like, just do your thing, right? You know, and tell me how it worked out. And so we started doing these social science, computer science hybrid experiments and processes. And one of the things the CIA asked is, can you look at all these big data? Can you see, based on how someone played, can you tell us who they're likely to be offline? Because we know there are Al-Qaeda terrorist cells in Second Life. No kidding, they really are. And we want to be able to understand, can you look at data to see this? And we actually wound up developing algorithms and being able to automatically say, based on the way this player is playing, that troll over there is likely to be a Republican male over 50. <laughs> and I didn't pick that as a way of being you know, bad to our conservative members of, of, our, of our country, but in fact, Republicans are substantially more likely to play trolls than liberals are, <laughs> substantially. Um, liberals are more likely to play halflings and, and elves and dwarves, and it, it's the stereotypes and the fun of the headlines you can write with this stuff, they just go on and on and on. So we develop all these fun data techniques, but one of the things we noticed, and this is partly because of this thing that we had in the back of our head, was that the biggest leverage we got out of these models wasn't just how people played and whether they were a troll or not, it was how they played together. And one of the reasons this came together the way it did was we, one of the things we were looking for were for cheaters in this game. And in online gaming, there is a phenomenon called gold farming, where people acquire assets, fake assets, and then sell them for real money. The game companies hate this stuff. And they said, can you find these people? And we said, I don't know, we'll go look. We ran lots of models. We got pretty good at finding them. But when we included who talked to who else and how they interacted with each other, then the models started getting really good, and we started getting 80%, 90%. And that's a way of catching criminals that you could never do before, because you're doing it like guilt by association, by looking at God level down at networks. That was pretty powerful. One of our um, graduate students came to us one day and said, professors, uh, I found a way of looking at what's called cascading through the graph, you know, how things spread, you know, kind of ripple on a pond effect. And I think I found a way to see when one node does something, the likelihood of somebody else to do something and uh, putting a, a number on that. Do you think that's important or valuable? And I was like, wait, what? You just, what? And what the student had invented without realizing at all was the ability to quantify influence. And we just thought, pardon my French, holy shit, um, let's patent this right away. And so we did, and what we did is we took these two techniques, we put them together, we invented an algorithm that will look at behaviors over time and we'll see how people influence each other and to reduce those things into some business metric. So it's not 
likelihood of getting fat, it's likelihood of spending money, or likelihood of clicking on an ad, or likelihood of spending time. The algorithm doesn't care what the outcome variable type is. And so what we've been able to do, and now to actually prove and we're commercializing, is the ability to take social graph data and transactional data and to see how you all are influencing each other to spend. So here's kind of how it works. Your name is Jim, and remind me your name again? Jill. Jill? So Jim and Jill. Let's say Jim and Jill become friends on Monday, and then on Saturday, Jim goes to see Iron Man 3, and on Sunday, Jill goes to see Iron Man 3. It's possible that Jim influenced her to go buy that movie ticket. We don't know for sure, but it's possible. But it's much less likely that the other thing happened because of the order of time, right? So our model starts seeing this pattern, and if it happens over and over and over, we start saying, Jim's a pretty influential guy for movies and for action movies. And so we start to have a score for how much he's going to spend on a movie and then how much he's going to get his friends to spend on that class of movies. And this is catnip to marketers, of course. So uh, is this a big deal? Well, McKinsey suggests it's accounted for somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of all decisions made. We were like, well, that's one of these wild hair claims that you can make when you're a forecasting firm. So we were very curious, you know, could we test this? And we've done a few commercial deployments as well as academic deployments, and I can now actually say the number in here as well as the distribution of influence across society for the first time, at least in our first tests. And we have found that influence does in fact account for somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of decisions we saw in the systems we tested. So that's something that people can now touch or think about for the very first time, and know exactly who did it and on who else. So pretty powerful stuff. We also found that the, the um, distribution of influence is wildly skewed. As you might expect, not everybody has the same amount of influence uh, in, their, in their social groups as others. We found that about 10 to 11 percent of people had about 60 percent of the influence across their groups. And so, of course, you want to know who those people are to do something with them, right? So it, it looks kind of like this, and I've got, a, I've got a weird formatting issue as well because of 16 by 9 resolution. It happens. I don't think it's necessarily Randy's team's fault. John, but it happens. Um, so we first develop a, a, a machine algorithm score which says what's the lifetime value of a person in a system. Pretend this is looking at you know movie ticket buying, and you know here are their values. But then this is the amount of money that their friends spend because of your, their interactions with those friends, and that nobody's ever seen before, and that's really cool. And so seeing the split between the the total of these two columns is that idea. Is it 70/30? Is it 90/10? Is it 10/90 in your service or product? <laughs> and the people who are highly influential, they're not always the big spenders and vice versa. So in one application, which I won't get into because of NDA reasons, we found the highest value of an individual person was they were going to spend 300 bucks, but the highest outbound social value was 900 bucks. And it wasn't the same person, right? Also really cool, we occasionally find negative values in this column. And that's the case where, let's say Jim says, Iron Man 3 is awesome, and everyone else is like, I'm not going to see Iron Man 3 now, man. <laughs> Jim guy said he liked it, and you know, I don't know about that. And so people actually could have a negative impact in social contagion, and you could actually depress things. And we found in a few rare cases where the negative values in column 2 were so large that they outweighed the value in column 1, meaning that person was a net negative on the system. So whether you're a game developer or a movie promoter, there are some people who actively don't want to use your goods and services, because they will, in the long run, depress your sales. They weren't worth the dollars. So adding the second column adds the human experience and element in a way that you just, you know, you never could have seen before. And when you resort it, <laughs> not in this resolution, um, <laughs> it gets really interesting. Um, we have built a piece of software that will do this and now does it on the fly. So this is big data analytics done um, at very large capacity. These are networks of millions of people. And it's taking, you know, it's not like, on the fly type stuff. It's a big algorithm, it's got to crunch a lot of stuff. But imagine it's a node of about a million people, about 15 minutes per million. So you can imagine this is going to get faster and better. If we're looking at 100 million people, it's going to take, you know, it's, it's linear, it doesn't, it doesn't go exponentially. But so you think, okay, I've got this person here, and I know that they are a bunch of gyms, right? How do I do something with that? And so if you're a marketer or running a company, you're going to want to impact gyms in the world. So we built a system that actually will, will let people test that and see what the spread is. So the ripple on the pond, the coattail effect of the influence that actually happens. And we built a tool out that says, based on the results of the test that we saw, here's what would happen if you did it on a large scale. And this is, to my knowledge, the world's first ever what if button for marketers. Because it's saying, if you try this promotion based on the test of you and your data, 
this is what will happen on a larger scale. This is how many dollars or whatever you'll make. And we're just having a lot of fun learning and seeing what works and what doesn't and working with companies. It's just been a, it's been a real blast and not something that uh, professors always get to do. Commercialization has some interesting uh, pros and cons, but uh, you know, uh, this is where I think innovation really happens when you combine weird fields like social and computer science. You get people in rooms together that wouldn't normally talk. Neat stuff gets invented. And so I'm really proud of the team that came up with this stuff. I'll stop there and be happy to take Q&A. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. I'll do uh, a couple questions for Dimitri and then general questions. This is really fascinating stuff and uh, it looks like tremendously powerful potential. Uh, powerful technology can be used in all sorts of ways. Some of them good, some of them not so good. That's right. Uh, I am not a Facebook uh, user because I don't quite trust their privacy policies. And Nor should you. I'm, and I'm wondering uh, if you have, for example, uh, uh, an opinion. Uh, about a year ago, the Obama administration put out this uh, Privacy Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And it's a, just a suggestion right now. But do you have any opinion on uh, application of those uh, in the commercial world? Um, I, I think that the policy... Um that comes out of the regulatory environment won't really matter. It'll be what the market will bear. And so I can give you my opinion, which is that I value and protect privacy and I hope that it matters. But the marketplace suggests that people will willingly give up their privacy if they get something relatively small in return. And you can quantify that, and it's depressingly small. Um, they, they ex if there's any good news, it's they expect something for it, and they're in on the game. That's the only upside I can come up with it. Um, the thing that makes me hopefully not lose a lot of sleep at night is that the kinds of t uses of my technology, to, to get to the Spider-Man aspect of your question that you're asking me, right? The with great power comes with great responsibility thing. Um, that's my shorthand for my students. This, we, just, we just say it's the Spider-Man question. Um, the things that the science says will work the best with use of this technology are uses where it's something that builds a relationship rather than something that is just adding on to it. So the smart and savvy marketer would use my tool to say, here is something for you and your friend to go enjoy, enjoy and do together, and it would reinforce the friendship. Realizing that when people go out and make transactions, a lot of times they're doing something because they want that hat or that shirt, but a lot of times when people do things together, it's not about the glass of wine or the spa they go to, it's the experience of being with their friend and saying, we're friends and I want to remain friends with you, and I really value that tie. So these links here between people, that's everything. And I think the best uses of this technology, and best meaning most pro-social as well as most financially um, valuable to the company will be those things that actually improve a relationship, strengthen that line, rather than just try to think about how to best monetize that person. I hope this is true. We will empirically know this fairly soon. And if it's not true, I'm really sad because I just made the world worse. So another question. I'll bring the mic over. But I think I'll be right. It seems to me that gaming companies, the first place you're getting your data from, the ones that are trying to do uh, games that are free to play, but they make money by selling people things, they would have the greatest use for your technology. That is correct. That is my area of expertise, and that is where we built out a, a large set of tools that answer the question, uh, which part of the game is leading to the best outcomes, and knowing who is going to leave and who's going to stay and who will take their friends with them. It helps for acquisition, which is a big part of the monetization path. It helps to understand the right kind of churn prevention. So if you know who brought friends with them and who will take friends with them when they go and how to take advantage of them when they're there, it fits the free-to-play model very, very nicely. Yeah. But, I mean, there are social and countrywide differences in behavior patterns. For example, I'll hold like people in gaming that the Chinese yeah. and China tend to buy stuff more uh -huh. than America. They tend to buy their way to win, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's a pattern we've seen before, um, and it's really an empirical question, right? So what you would do is, to do a perfect test of this, you would take a game that's available in two places, so treatment control, basically, and you would look at the graphs and stats and compare and contrast the U.S. market versus the Chinese market. So you take a game that's been localized, like World of Warcraft, um, well, that wouldn't work with free-to-play, but a similar title where you actually could see or do those behaviors differ. I mean, anecdotally, they, they do. We, you're right about it, for sure. The social patterns are different. There is a cultural difference. There's a baseline of human behavior that is the same worldwide, and then there are variations from it. Um, so 
so individuals obviously affect each other and influence each other, mm -hmm. um, but uh, individuals are also uh, influenced by groups of all sizes, mm -hmm. uh, individuals and in, in masses and consensus mm -hmm. uh, that they can visually see or see, perceive. Um, do you guys study just one-on-one -on -one type of uh, influential direction, or do you study like group on individual uh, influence as well? So the, the, the atom, if you will, in our system is the relationship between any two people. So the relationship between account number nine and account number 23 is something we measure. And companies aren't really ready to use that or work with it. So what we're simply doing is adding up their total aggregate. So we're giving them the net total of everything else. But of course, this graph goes beyond just here. It's just that you get this thing where, as you go what are called degrees out, as you go out in degrees, the, the metaphor, the ripple on the pond becomes particularly apt because the ripples become weaker and weaker and weaker. So there are people who are two or three or four degrees away from you who are influencing you, but that influence is so much smaller than people in your immediate graph. So we don't actually display them because it also gets really messy to see. So yes, that's there and that's sort of built into our model because it's the, the sum total of whatever that is. But then you get in some really interesting questions about actionability. You know, how would you take advantage of that? If it's two or three degrees out, is it something you really touch or do? Whereas if it's you and your near friend, it's much stronger, you might actually do something with that. Are there any general questions that might be posed to either speaker at this point in time? Yeah. Do you ever see like resonance effects where things become synchronized and, and, and would say resonate with a, a daily cycle or a, a diurnal cycle, something like that? Um, we see lots of effects uh, in the predictive models around behaviors more generally that, that are a result of broader human patterns, as in things that are seasonal or related to the academic calendar for when there is a young audience. Um, you see a lot of patterns with peaks and valleys that obviously relate to sleeping patterns, that kind of thing. But I don't think we, we know enough to answer that question on a social level yet. This is a really early days for this technology. And what you ask is provocative, but we're not there yet. <laughs> Well, that's Gangnam style, right? You know, and, and to, to know when, well, if you're going to use jargon with me, I mean, I <laughs> throw it right back at you. I mean, yeah, there's, a, there's this sense of when something goes viral and spreads, it's got to have some sort of escape velocity out of a local neighborhood where it actually gets past a, a point and keeps going. And we don't yet know when those points are that well, but this is technology and visualization that could obviously tell you that kind of thing. Let me just ask, you want to answer that? Yeah, uh, we had a little funny example of that during the presidential debates. So um, there was this meme, binders full of women. <laughs> and to watch that, because we were watching these debates in real time, and so we would enter the keyword into the system as soon as we heard something like that that you knew was going to be weird. And then just to watch it go out and go crazy, uh, it, you know, in minutes was pretty interesting. So, you know, it's hard to say. You're also, there's a, there's a unit of analysis, level analysis thing here, because what I've described is local boots on the ground level. What John is describing <coughs> is zeitgeisty, big, and these are different tools for different questions. Yeah. So in the first graph you showed was this contagious effect. Mm -hmm. How can a retailer or a commercial enterprise use your analytics to create that on a proprietary basis where it's not open to the entire world? What kind of purchase data or big data can they analyze or techniques in order to create that contagious effect within groups of customers? Because in, in many cases, retailers don't even know who their customers are, right? You walk yeah. in the door. But mobile technology is changing that. They're checking in. Mm -hmm. They have their app. They've registered. They have mobile payment. Yes, they are. They now know <laughs> that they're there <laughs> they before, the during, and after. <laughs> so, but a retailer doesn't necessarily want, you know, they, they, they want them to use their own app yeah. to find the product, review yeah. the product, pay for it. They don't want to... Cl closing their app and opening up a Google wallet and le letting Google get all the big data and then having to pay Google for it. So how does a retailer make this prior a proprietary means to build their own franchise value? 
Well, there were about six different questions in there, and so I'm going to pick just a couple of them. I like them all, and I'll answer the other four after, when everybody's gone, if you like. Um, but essentially, the technique is the same either way. You're still talking about finding the influential people and acting through them. The data <coughs> availability question tells you what sectors this can be applied in and where it can't. So I can't take this to Target tomorrow because they don't know. They know who their customers are, and they're actually quite sophisticated at linking people to their transaction records. What they don't do is have the links between people, right? There's no social graph to connect them to. So I call that closing the loop. And the ultimate way of closing the loop, of course, would be to use your phone records if you're buying things using near field communication, right? But unfortunately, or fortunately, as the case may be, you may not use phone records for marketing purposes. So I cannot construct a social graph for this purpose to do it. Um, the world is moving that way. And there's no question in 10 years I'll be able to use this on just about everything. In the short term, it's where can you find social data and transactional data right now? And the answer was, as the gentleman pointed out in the back, everywhere in gaming period, because you don't even have to take Facebook data, because gaming is a social experience. You build a graph based on the nature of the phenomenon. And the next set of answers is anybody using any other open graph technology with a social sign-in. So if you're using Spotify or Fandango, you said, yeah, I use my Facebook sign-in so I don't have to fill out this registration form. And do, do I want to share my basic data? And you go, yeah, whatever, whatever that is. You just gave me the social graph. And I'm like, sweet, I'm off and running. But lots of companies there, more all the time. So I guess the one who enrolls is the one who controls, right? If Target enrolls you for their app, yeah. then they'll have that. Social yeah, but, but, but also yeah. watch Facebook become more of a vendor, more of a pl player. Watch Google become more <laughs> of a player in this space. I mean, Google Wallet isn't there just because it's convenient. It's yeah. another data collection point and another But Facebook's point. the one that's enrolled the customer. They're aggregated the data. They've made the data open. But there, by virtue of their open graph, has said, use this for what you will, and let developers do it. And that dog, that uh, um, cow is out of the barn, right? So. Have a question over here. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. First of all, I found uh, both of your talks really fascinating. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about combining the two. Um, so the easy example is. Um, you were able to count totally the number of negative it. tweets and the number of positive tweets, but the, like, what if we could weigh, the, uh, or what if we could weigh each tweet individually rather than giving everything a score of one? Say like, this isn't uh, you know an individual who has a high influence like Chris Rock or right. or these comedians who their their tweet is perhaps worth more than uh, just simple you know counting. Well, I mean, Dimitri and I made a joint presentation to a major motion picture studio about a few months ago, and. You know, what he had was, this is what people are actually doing. You know, this is, if you, had, if you could take their, let's say all the movies are in the cloud now, and you've got, you're running a movie service, so you can collect the cloud. That he could actually tell you how people influence other people to do it. The data we're collecting is people's intention to go see a movie or something like that, or people's desire to go see a movie, and if you could cross the two, we think it would be pretty powerful. I mean, Cloud, Cred, Radian 6 are services <coughs> that purport to do this crossing of the exercises. They imply that they're talking about behaviors, but they're really talking about opinions and speech. And there's a pretty big, bright line between those things. I think that's very interesting and still very useful, but I share John's skepticism about their um, uh, opacity with their methods. Do one last question. Oh, I see two hands at the same time. We'll do two last questions, and then we'll wrap up. So based on your pr presentation, Professor Taplin, um, studying the model of how people talk about films and in marketing and in Twitter, what if someone has an independent film and they don't have enough money to go into the advertisement? Would you then recommend them go into the social media marketing more? Yeah. Uh, uh, we think that actually this notion that you could create something just through social media is pretty powerful. And, you know, obviously, Coney 2012, you take some example like that, you can see how at, if the right passage and the right thing gets passed without any marketing at all, it can blow up. And that's pretty much worth, you know, following and trying to understand better. Hey, thanks for um, this talk. It, it's been really fascinating. Um, so my question is kind of a, a, a larger one for both of you. Um, so as a, a tech marketer, we've heard this, this term big data over and over again over the last three, five years. Um, 
what is it, what's our, what are our responsibilities as communicators, as business people, and as influencers in tech to educate those who maybe don't know what big data is and know how to, it affects them? Wow, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> There's a huge wave of data and not enough people who understand it. Um, the best thing you can do is find a young person and tell them to take the right courses because they're going to become very, very successful and be in high demand for their jobs. I mean, engineers in Silicon Valley can write their own ticket right now. Data analysts, that's the next wave of that. So if you want to do a public service, find a young person and tell them to take computer science. But to know what the heck they're talking about, take a couple of social science courses on the side. Um, the business application here is big data can be good, they can be pretty, but can you do something that's actionable? Um, to go from that was cool, and I hate to use this in an insulting way, but I'll do it to myself, academic, to something that has a, a bottom line value. Can you marry the two? Can you take something from the lab and actually apply it and change practices? That's a huge leap that not everybody can figure out. Yeah, I, I would just say one other kind of cautionary note, which is I, I love what Dimitri's doing because he's doing it around real world actions that people are taking. The one place where I'm beginning to worry is the role of the advertising business uh, in the online sphere. And I think there's potential for real abuse of people dropping cookies everywhere in this real time auctioning. You know, you, you look at a site to go for a Mexican vacation, someone drops a cookie on your computer, and the next time you come to a travel site, there's eight people bidding for you, they don't care where you are, to get to drop that next ad on you, and they will keep doing it and doing it and doing it until you finally give up, you know? I mean, you wonder why there's so many times you get a Netflix ad. Well, they're going to keep putting it there until you finally give up and sign up for Netflix. And so I, I, that's my worry is, is the advertising industry in the online sphere is the most untransparent industry in the world. I, I have spent five years on Wall Street and uh, I, we used to talk about dark markets. The online ad network business is the darkest of dark markets and they gotta be careful because they could screw up something good, you know, and who knows what would happen. Okay. One last round of applause for all of our speakers. <laughs>